Lakeland Public Television presents Currents with host Ray Gildow. Sponsored by Nisswa Tax Service, offering tax preparation for individuals and businesses across from the City Hall in Nisswa and on the web at nisswatax.com. Hello again everyone and welcome to our eighth season of Lakeland Currents. And we're coming to you tonight for the first time ever in high definition. So we're pretty excited about that in our Brainerd studio. We've had high definition in our Bemidji studio now for a couple years, but it's the first time we've come to you in this area with a high definition camera. So uh, pretty excited about that. Also excited to have Nisswa Tax back as an underwriter for this program again. As I said, it's our eighth year and we appreciate the support they have given us through all these seasons of Lakeland Currents. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about probably an issue that's more important than a lot of people in the world recognize. Uh, futurists are saying that the next wars are gonna be over this resource. Not oil, but water, fresh water. Uh, the world is running out of it in many, many different places. Minnesota is blessed to be having some of the greatest fresh water in the world and so it's important that we recognize that and take steps to take care of it. So tonight we're going to be talking about the title of our program is Water Conservation in the Mississippi Headwaters, the latest science, mythology, and collaborations. And my guests are experts, and if you don't believe them, ask them. They'll tell you that they are. No, they really truly are. To my right is Todd Holman, who is the Mississippi Headwaters Program Director for the Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota chapters of Nature Conservancy. And we'll come back and talk a little bit about what that is. Uh, he has worked for the Conservancy since 2004. Todd taught middle school and high school math and science. In 1992, uh, he became the Land Use Planning Director in Todd County, then later in Crow Wing County. Todd also served the Community Development Director for the City of Baxter and continues to serve that community as a second term vice mayor. So welcome on board. And to his right is uh, Dan Stewart. Dan, you look so serious, you can lighten up a little bit. We're here to have fun. <laughs> Dan is a board conservationist with the Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources. He has over 35 years of experience working on water management issues. He's worked with this board uh, in six county areas in north central Minnesota, including Aiken, Cass, Crow Wing, Itasca, Morris, and Todd counties. He's a graduate of Mankato State University with a degree in geography, later studied hydrology at the University of Minnesota, and now lives on a small lake in Deerwood, Minnesota, has a special interest in help, bu helping build and implement a strong water quality protection strategy through the combination of local water planning and private forest managements. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. It's a really an important topic. I think probably more so than a lot of people think about, mm -hmm. and you guys are doing some cutting edge things, so maybe we could start out a little bit, Todd, if you could just tell us a little bit about the Nature Conservancy. Sure, sure, and thank you for having us today. Um, the Nature Conservancy is a 501c3 nonprofit conservation organization, and as the, uh, the bio indicated, we, our chapter represents Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota, um, but we're actually an international conservation organization working in um, 30 some countries around the world as well um, on all of our conservation objectives and our mission is to protect land and water uh, for all life on earth so a very broad mission and that opens the door for multiple partnerships and opportunities to work and collaborate with folks on a shared conservation vision. And, and Dan could you just tell us a little bit about the board that you serve on? Yes, I work for the Board of Water and Soil Resources. The board is the uh, one of the state agency conduits for uh, getting conservation done through local units of government. So we work primarily to uh, with soil and water conservation districts that cover the entire state, watershed districts, which cover about a quarter of the state, and the counties uh, as another uh, important conservation opportunity at the local level of government. And, that, and these are all focused on private lands, so it's a delivery mechanism that the legislature has put in place to deliver conservation to private lands and landowners in Minnesota. Now your particular program is being brought together uh, in co-sponsorship today with the Rosenmeyer Center at Central Lakes College, the Rosenmeyer Center for State and Local Government. And uh, that's part of Central Lakes College operation and for people who aren't familiar with the Rosenmeyer Center, their primary mission is to educate the citizens of Minnesota on key issues of the day. So uh, we want to recognize the Rosenmeyer Center. This is about the third program we've done with the Rosenmeyer Center and uh, they do have some very good work over there. So 
Todd, let's sort of talk a little bit about what are some of the uh, what are some of the real issues that are facing us in water quality, and that's in the Mississippi headwaters specifically. Sure, sure. Um, we recognize, as you indicated, uh, in, a, in a state like Minnesota that's water rich, uh, we, we sometimes downplay the value of water and think about it as an infinite resource. Uh, when most of the uh, or newer awarenesses are coming uh, through water study and when we see things happening on the water front, especially in the Mississippi Headwaters area, uh, that, that the water can be a limiting or is limited in some cases. We've seen um, nitrate related groundwater issues in communities uh, in in Park Rapids, uh, the city of Randall and, and, and a few other places around. Um, we've seen a lot of land use conversion um, both on the agricultural side and on urban growth. <coughs> so these are all um, things that we have to be mindful of as we think about um, how do we protect all of the resources and how do we put a value on, on water specifically um, that maybe we haven't thought about before because it's been abundant or at least perceived to be abundant. So uh, the Nature Conservancy is working to try to uh, think about the, the protection of that water resource, source water, groundwater, uh, surface water connection, uh, specifically in the headwaters. This is a healthy waters part of the state. Other areas have, uh, you, you may well have heard of uh, the swimmable, fishable um, struggles in southern Minnesota. Um, up in the Mississippi headwaters, this is where the really high quality water still exists. And so our work is to try to protect and develop strategies and collaborate with others that share that same vision of, of uh, protecting water in could, the headwaters. Could you help our viewers understand what is the geographic area that you're talking about when you say the Mississippi headwaters? Generally, my work area is, is from St. Cloud northward, but we're thinking about all the way out from Wadena on the west, you know, over to uh, Mille Lacs on the east side, you know, that gives you a picture of the size of, the, and then up through Grand Rapids and Park Rapids on the north down to St. Cloud. So it's a very large geography. Um, and many towns and communities dependent on, on well, well water systems. And then downstream, this area is actually the uh, source water. This is where the water comes from that supplies the surface water that cities like St. Cloud and Minneapolis St. Paul depend on. Over a million people depend on the Mississippi River for their drinking water. So it's important locally, tourism, recreation, our drinking water, and and regionally um, to the greater metropolitan area as well. If you look at uh, this area and you look at the surface water, which is our rivers and our lakes, how does the groundwater compare in volume? I mean, roughly, is it is it somewhat equal? Or if you could say there's, I, I know there's some huge underwater mm, areas. The aquifers. The aquifer systems. And, and does anybody have a handle on how those two stack up? It's a great question. I don't have the, the gallons metric, perhaps, that you no, might I, be looking I, for. Not looking for that. Um, but. What we do know is that this upper Mississippi River Basin, this central sands area of Minnesota, is geologically uh, glacial till. And so we do know that there's strong connectivity uh, between the surface water and the groundwater. So unlike some areas where you might have clay or other types of soils where the surface water isn't quite as connected to the groundwater, our area it's very connected. And so um, I don't know the volumes there, but in my mind it's all connected so there really isn't a dividing layer or a line between surface water and groundwater. They're all connected. What we do to the surface water affects our groundwater and vice versa. And aquifers also have flowing water, do they not? Yeah. I mean, there's water moving all the time, and I don't know if people always think of that. Um, a lot of attention was given this past year to one of the ag businesses in northern Minnesota, cutting a lot of timber and, and turning some areas into cropland. And I know one of the big concerns during that process was what's happening if that water tables are really shallow you know, if they're down 15, 20 feet through the soil and they hit the aquifers, is that going to make them really susceptible to nitrogen and that sort of thing? That's been a, a huge conserve, uh, concern, uh, was given a lot of press in the Twin City papers and stuff. And I know that the company involved and the companies, there's actually been more than one, they're, they're concerned about this too. They're not working independently from the rest of us. They're all part of the fabric of drinking and using this water too. But that's, a, that's been a huge issue. And I, and I know when you look at southern Minnesota, there's areas where there's nitrogen's level high enough where they're recommending children not mm -hmm. drink out of some of those wells. 
So are those things that you're trying to look at here to prevent that from happening before it's too late? I think we, the Nature Conservancy, in partnership with Board of Water and DNR and all of our agency and nonprofit partners, are really looking at trying to identify where uh, the best types of conservation practices can hit the ground where they'd be most effective to uh, protect groundwater and surface water. Um, you're, you're right, all of those land use impacts have, a, have an impact one way or another on, on the water system, groundwater or surface water system. Um, the DNR has uh, implemented, I think they're two years into the groundwater management area study in the Park Rapids area and then out by um, uh, White Bear Lake and the metro area and then um, Belgrade. So they had three areas where the DNR specifically is looking at um, groundwater flows and measures and looking specifically at how you know, we might permit or regulate or manage differently than maybe we have. Uh, uh, so without a doubt, um, there's a lot of interest at a lot of levels on that. So Dan, what is your board focused on then in, in these kinds of issues? How, how do you fit into the p picture? Well, one of the main tools that we would bring is the uh, county water planning process. And that's a process whereby the legislature set this up back in 1985. And uh, counties are encouraged, not required, but encouraged to do five-year water, to do county water plans, which are updated every five years. And so uh, the last time around, uh, when that five-year interval was up and uh, counties in this area, especially Crow Wing County, were updating their water plan, uh, we just thought it'd be interesting to work real closely with a county uh, that tried to develop a water plan that was designed from the outset for a pr from a protection perspective, and that means uh, protection by that we mean where water quality is still good. We're protecting water quality that's good. We're not trying to restore it because in most cases there's a few ex exceptions but in most cases it's, it's good in this area. And so rather than waiting till things are kind of degraded and run down and, and whatnot, uh, get ahead of that and, and set up a water plan that aims to protect. And as we all know, an ounce of, uh, of pre uh, prevention is worth a pound of cure and so on and pennies on the dollar you can normally protect as compared to restoring water resources if it's, they're restorable at all. Sometimes the cost there is just absolutely prohibitive and they aren't restorable. So we want to get ahead of that curve and see if a county could work uh, intensively in that regard and uh, Crow Wing County uh, in particular really rose to that occasion and wrote an outstanding water plan that we're excited about. Uh, the adjacent counties are excited. Morrison County would like to uh, go down a similar path for a plan for their county and uh, as are Cass and Aiken counties. So we, we would like to see it extend all the way through the eight counties that comprise the upper Mississippi basin that Todd just described. So if a county is working on putting a plan together to prevent more or, or pollution or whatever the issues might be, what are some of the options they look at? That's a good question. One of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to have data um, we didn't have a lot of money to work with, so we don't have time to go out or funds to go out and collect new data. We wanted to use existing data, uh, land use information, uh, GIS, Geographic Information System, review and analysis of that land use information, as well as existing water quality data that because uh, we have a lot of lakes in this area, we have a lot of lake associations, and many of those lake associations <coughs> have been collecting water quality data for decades, thank goodness. That we were able to take that existing information and kind of crunch it and summarize it in such a way that we could see where there might be some areas where there were declining trends in water quality, lakes specifically, and then uh, all these lakes aren't created equally uh, for sure, so other lakes are stable in terms of their water quality trend, they're just holding their own, which is a good outcome, and others are actually increasing in water quality, and we needed to separate those so that we could um, help counties to just give them information so they can make better decision as to what their water management priorities might be. So let's say uh, Aiken County identifies a lake as being degraded somewhat. Mm -hmm. What would be the causes of that in, in, in our area, in most of the area? What, what, what are we talking about? Well generally to, to look at that I, I would just use the term disturbance. Uh, the more as, as parts of that watershed whether it's from urban development or agricultural development or whatever kind of development it might be, power lines, roads, whatever modern society brings with it, um, as we get past a 25% disturbance level in the, of the watersheds area, we start to see water quality trends uh, decline. 
there starts to be an impact that's noticeable on water quality at that point. So um, certain lakes have, have had high levels of watershed disturbance. Other lakes have had very little watershed disturbance. Uh, and then on the receiving end to the lake, some lakes are deep and cold and large, and they're much more resilient to watershed change than smaller lakes that are shallow. So it's trying to sort all, all these differences that our water resources come in and so that we can make uh, more informed decisions about priorities. So <clears throat> when you, um, I think in Gall Lake, for example, I think there's, for every mile of shoreland, there's about 27 or 28 homes or cabins mm -hmm. for every mile. <clears throat> so are we looking then at a lot of phosphorus and nitrogen going into those lakes? Is that what's, is that what's causing it? Yeah, I would say to a great extent it is as we change the watershed and we deforest part of it, um, these lakes were to a very great extent groundwater driven previous to modern settlement. And so in forested watersheds have very little to no runoff. It's really, especially on sandy soils like we have in Kerwin County for the most part, there's really a tremendous amount of infiltration of that rain into the, into the ground and then eventually into the bottom of the lake through groundwater flows. Um, but as we clear parts of the watershed and harden it with pavement, rooftops, roads, et cetera, we're changing a certain percent of that hydrologic budget from a groundwater driven system to a surface water system. Well then when the water flows over the surface it picks up things like your phosphorus and, and nitrogen, your nutrients with it that lead to declined clarity and water quality degradation. Todd, in the, with the Nature Conservancy, are, do you still look at getting properties that you can set aside that protect some of the lakes? Do you, does the Nature Conservancy do you still have that sort of an activity? Oh, without a doubt. Um, it's highly targeted and strategic now. As a matter of fact, we tend to work with local county water plans and our partners that have water protection plans to try to align the science of where that protection, that actual land protection might be. And uh, we recognize, and I think most do, that you cannot buy enough land to protect the water resource. You really, it, you know, the future of water protection and conservation is really in the hands of private landowners. And so there's, there, but there are parts that might have a, a, a fee acquisition side, maybe there's an easement side to that, and then ultimately programs and incentive programs, best management practices that, that roll out from local units of government as well. So the Nature Conservancy does have an eye toward protection. Um, it isn't necessarily us that's doing that work. We may be collaborating with multiple partners. So how, how many organizations in Minnesota are involved in some of these activities? I think for an outsider who's not involved with government, um, it's hard to get your arms around mm. You know, we've got the DNR and we've got a different soil and water conservation groups. Roughly how many people are there and are they, are they working closer together than they were 10 years ago to solve these problems? That's a great question and a great uh, chance to talk about a local success story. It isn't this way everywhere, but in this particular north central region, there are probably seven or eight nonprofit organizations that are conservation organizations. I think about the Nature Conservancy, the Leech Lake Area Watershed Foundation, um, the Trust for Public Land, Minnesota Land Trust, and I could finish the list. Um, but that, those groups have come together along with Dan from the Board of Water and Soil Resources, folks from D DNR, folks from Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, and our group is called the North Central Conservation Roundtable. Now that's a mouthful, but it's a really cohesive group that really that meets regularly to try to work collaboratively and strategically so that it isn't fractionalized autonomous work, it's really a group working together to all boats float, philosophy, implement an all boats float philosophy um, to recognize the special specialization that each group has and brings to the table. So you, you I mean, I, obviously politics are involved in everything, but you don't really try to get into the political arena of policy so much with your organizations as you do try to collaborate together to see how you can work together to solve problems. We have the Sandpiper Project uh, mm -hmm. on the table here. We have mining up in northeastern Minnesota on the table here. Both of those could have some pretty dramatic impacts on water quality. Do your organizations get involved with that at all, or do you just sort of st you stay in out of the politics of that? 
I, it's really an emotional topic. <clears throat> it is. I, I'll speak from my work in the Mississippi Headwaters uh, area, and that is that we haven't taken positions on those, those infrastructure projects, for example. Um, we try to stay focused on where the science is directing us, and our implementation is really at the minor watershed level. We look and plan at the large, the major watershed level, uh, but we know that the real work, the conservation work gets done and often delivered by local soil and water conservation districts and other partners, DNR and others. Um, so we we tend to focus on what we know, you know, and that's where the science is directing us uh, for protection. And not uh, right now, we have not really focused on some of the other. Um, there are other groups really focused and working on those, and, and rightly so. Uh, but our work has really been looking at at protection in the in the broad sense of the Mississippi Upper Mississippi River Basin. So if we have a, a lake that is polluted, that's damaged, is there any hope for that lake? And I, I don't necessarily, I'm not referring to any particular lake, but I know in parts of the United States there are, there are areas that are pretty damaged. Is there any science moving in the direction to try to fix that, or is it just right now beyond capability of doing anything about it? I think that'll depend a great deal on the lake and particular that we'd be talking about. Again, depth makes, it, makes a big factor, big, big difference in a lake's uh, resilience to water quality change and, and so on. Shallow lakes, you know, usually um, kind of they are what they are and they're not big, deep, cool, uh, Cisco, you might say, fishery lakes and, and we should always kind of tend to view them. That doesn't mean they aren't important, they're just important for a different reason, probably to a different fishery and probably also maybe to the wildlife side. So uh, we need to keep, uh, uh, we're a lot more efficient when we keep the lakes from degrading in the first place or catch them in time before they get to that impaired level, that threshold. And so uh, I think there's a lot of things we can do to uh, restore shoreland vegetation, slow down that water, try to put that uh, water cycle back to the way it was, more groundwater infiltration driven. Uh, we can permanently protect parts of the watershed that, uh, that doesn't need to be, and I don't think usually will be fee title ownership, but it could mean conservation easements and programs like the Sustainable Forest Incentives Act, which is mm -hmm. another tool the legislature's provided for us to put this together out in the field and, and cobble together a good, strong uh, water quality protection strategy, and that's really what our overall effort is about. I know the governor uh, implemented a program this year of having a set aside 50 feet, I think, from mm -hmm. rivers and lakes. Are your organizations involved at all in the implementation of that? Uh, Board of Water and Soil Resources has some responsibilities uh, under that new legislation, the buffer uh, legislation, and that'll uh, apply more uh, strongly in, in the parts of the watershed where you have bare land, agricultural land usually adjacent to public waters and, and uh, public uh, private ditches that feed public waters. Um, but in the forested part of the state where there most cases areas are vegetated already, um, there, there's a, uh, there isn't a bare ground situation and so implementation in the forested zone I would see is rolling out a lot differently than in the uh, agricultural part of the state. And I, w I know we haven't talked about wetlands, but wetlands are certainly a key component to water quality. Uh, are your organizations focused on wetlands at all? Or I, I think we're kind of at zero loss for wetlands right now. I believe it's sort of stabilized, hasn't it, in the state? I don't know exactly what the um, report would be for the last year or two, but I think it's nearing that, if not at that, perhaps. Um, it depends also how that is calculated and what assumptions go into those, those, um, those figures. Uh, we do have a strong wetland protection uh, act in Minnesota that's implemented mainly through the local units of government uh, counties and soil and water conservation districts, in some cases cities. And so that, that is a uh, seen as one of the stronger, I believe, legislations nationally in terms of wetland protection. Um, and so, yeah, what, our basic infrastructure up here for clean water, you might say, are, I would, I would argue, first of all, it's the sandy soils. Uh, they may be a, a, a threat on the groundwater side because they allow, you know, impurities to work their way down into groundwater, but they're a plus from a lake water quality perspective because they allow there not to be surface runoff. And so when the water comes out of the bottom of the lake in, in a groundwater type contribution to the budget, it's, it's a positive thing. 
So we've got sandy soils that, that promote infiltration. And then on top of that, most all of these sandy soils are forested. That's a huge uh, plus for uh, a water quality protection start. Then we also have, as you've mentioned, thousands and thousands of acres of wetlands in northern Minnesota that are largely intact. Some of them may be altered a little bit around the edges here and there, but um, mostly they're intact. That's another thing that really uh, serves as a sponge, slows down uh, water runoff, uh, beaver dams uh, further slow it down, you know, and we have a vastly different uh, hyd hydrologic system or delivery mechanism up here than, than in the uh, prairie portion of the state. And so that, those are good uh, points to start from. <clears throat> and on top of that, then we have uh, a considerable amount of public land in the north part of the state as well. Uh, public land really starts with the forested zone in Crow Wing County and progressively works uh, more and more as you can work north to the border with uh, county, state, and federal lands that uh, in some cases are 50% of the county. So those kind of serve as, in our thinking, as building blocks for a future water quality starting point. Now how do we work then from that, the sandy soils, the forests, and the public lands toward protecting and buffering those private lands that are remaining? It's really interesting stuff, and we're down to our last minute. <laughs> what, uh, how could people get a hold of you folks if they wanted to become involved and they're not involved? What, what should they be doing? One good thing would be to contact the counties and the county water plan coordinator, as many counties in this area are updating their water plans, uh, either uh, are about to start or have already uh, got that process underway. Uh, the counties are looking for folks to contribute quite often on the water plan task forces. That There is a uh, need there for public input on that uh, water plan uh, revision or update. So that'd be one place to plug in. Great. And folks can reach me uh, through nature.org, which is our Nature Conservancy website, the Minnesota section, and the Freshwater Program specifically, and that will link them to me. Uh, my I office in Brainerd, and so I'm in the phone book. Thank you, guys. Really, really important works. Thanks to the Rosenmeyer Center also for being a sponsor for this program. You've been watching Lakeland Currents, and thank both of you, and we'll follow you. you closely down the road. Uh, you've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow. So long until next time.